What's up everybody? Welcome to Talk Wrestling here on NoDQ.com and of course the NoDQ YouTube channel. Thank you guys for watching this week. We've got plenty of questions to go through. Let's start with our old buddy Greg Cherry who's got a series of questions for me to address. I'll go ahead and address them one by one, Greg, as I always do, try to do for you. His first question is, what do you believe is the most effective finisher? Not your favorite necessarily, but which one is the most believable? Um... It's going to be a very cliche answer, Greg, but I honestly believe that the most effective finisher was the Stone Cold Stunner. And I'll tell you why. Because not only was it a kick to the gut, which always just doubles people over and always really gets them breathing hard and gets them questioning whether they can go on, but then you got a guy taking your jaw and just going crack right up on your shoulder. So that's going to hurt. No question about that. Um... The Stone Cold Stunner was up there for me. The the Pedigree is a, is a great finisher, always very believable. Um, some guys didn't take it as well as others. I, I remember, I always remember the guys that took it to one knee, which is always hideous looking. But I think since Seth Rollins has been doing the Pedigree, it's looked a lot better. Uh, not very many uh, botched finishes, or not botched Pedigrees, if you will. Um, just a couple here and there. Triple H seemed to have more in his uh, 20 years with it. But definitely the Pedigree, definitely the Stone Cold Stunner. Um, the Tombstone early on was, but as Undertaker progressed and as Kane progressed, it became more of the fact that they were like kind of like not hitting the Mac. They were kind of like stopping right here and not really finishing the move. So that kind of defeats the purpose of the, of the Tombstone. So for me, it's overall it's a Stone Cold Stunner, Greg. What is the most obscure match that you enjoy? One that is not up there for greatest matches ever, but one that you personally enjoyed. Wow. Um, well, one that doesn't get a whole lot of credit, I feel, in my opinion, was the 1991 War Games match, which was the Horseman minus Arn, but plus Larry Zabisco versus Sting's team. WWE booking was horrendous by then. It was toward the end of the Jim Hurt administration. But that match, I think, came off very well. Yeah, there was a botched um, there was a botched uh, thing with Pillman landing on the back of his neck, kind of, with the powerbomb from Psycho Sid. Or Sid Vicious, excuse me, not Psycho Sid. But um, there was no real botched stuff other than that. I thought that match came off very well. Uh, another match that doesn't get a whole lot of credit is another War Games match, in my opinion, was 92, which was Sting Squadron versus the Dangerous Alliance. Led by Paul Dangerously, okay, Paul Heyman. Uh, both those, both of these matches are really, really good. I think they both came off very well. I don't get a whole lot of credit in the industry. If you go back and watch the War Games Blu-ray or DVD that they put out with Dusty Rhodes hosting, both those matches just look solid on TV. Uh, another match I don't think gets a whole lot of credit as far as now, but did back then, was the Boiler Room Brawl between The Undertaker and Mankind. I thought that match... For being filmed the day before and being more like a movie than anything else, was very, very well filmed, very well presented, very well conceived, and very well executed. I thought that match was awesome. Let's see what else Greg has for me here. Who are your top three celebrity in ring performers? Mr. T. Carl Maloney, the only had one match, he was still awesome. And somebody's undefeated at WrestleMania, Maria Menounos. She even wrestled with broken ribs and still pulled off an awesome match at WrestleMania that year. Maria's, and she, she looks like she's a great athlete, at least she did in the ring with the divas that were there in the ring with her at the time. So Maria Menounos up there, Carl Malone for his awesome showing at Bash the Beach 98, and of course the original celebrity in WWE, Mr. T. But all three of those people were just freaking awesome, I thought. Who were the three superstars that benefited the most from a face-slash-heel turn? First of all, you got to think Hulk Hogan, who, at the time he turned into Hollywood Hogan in 1996, was getting more booze anyway than he was cheers in WCW. His career had very much tapered off. It wasn't really doing anything... Big gangbusters like it was early on WCW and especially WWE. Uh, Supreme Turn Heel really benefited him the most. 
Uh, another one who went from face to or heel to face was um, Stone Cold Steve Austin in 1996-97. Uh, who would ever thought the Stone Cold, ice through his veins, serial killer type guy would have been the most overrated face of all time? Certainly not me, certainly not a lot of us. And he showed that he can have this badass, mean demeanor, this gruff exterior, and still appeal to the masses by simply tweaking stuff here and there about his character and about the way he presented himself, it just works so well. Um, another one that benefited from doing both was Undertaker, who every time he turned, whether it was one way or the other, he always benefited, always always made his character fresh, always made his character more uh, believable, always made his character more uh, appealing to the masses, always made his character more... Uh, engrossed in storylines and always made him the forefront of whatever he was involved in, whether he was a bad guy or a good guy. He was awesome either way. Greg's final question, who was the best wrestler that was the worst person on the microphone? Now, not to kick a guy while he's down, unfortunately, but Chris Benoit. Chris Benoit was never a good promo guy, ever, ever, ever. He never really, um, in my opinion anyway, never really... Uh, measured up to his mic skills the way that he did in the ring. Chris Benoit was probably the one of the greatest, if not the greatest, in-ring technical performers I ever saw in my life, live or on TV. But his mic skills were always just hideous. He can he was he never had a really good decent he never really had a good promo. Even as a member of the horseman he was was a good promo guy. He had a few shiny moments here and there, but overall his promo skills were just meh. and that's saying for me, some amateur guy who's just sitting here in front of a camera talking to you guys on YouTube. But I never liked Chris Benoit's promos. I just never did. All right. This is from Tyler Joseph Smith. He has two questions for me. His first one says, if you could pick the headliner for the Call of Fame Class 2016, who would you choose? Considering they're going to Dallas, considering they're going to Texas, and they're going to have WrestleMania there, and after what happened in SummerSlam and things like that, i got to go with The Undertaker. Undertaker is the guy who is going to be the cornerstone of the Hall of Fame now that Hulk Hogan has been excommunicated, now that Ric Flair is already a two-time Hall of Famer. He's no, there's no longer a appeal to him being in the Hall of Fame anymore. He already got his rings. So Undertaker's going to be the guy who's going to head up that class next year and is really going to say, hey, here's the stamp. Undertaker's the man. He deserves this. He belongs here. He's one of the best ever, if not the best ever, and he'll make a huge impact when he does go in the Hall of Fame. The other question from Tyler says, do you think it is time for Daniel Bryan to hang it up? Um, I hope not. I hope not, but I believe it is going to be his time to say goodbye. And it sucks, because I like Bryan. I always have liked Bryan. I've made no bones about the fact that I am a Bryan Danielson guy, more than I am any other current WWE superstar. Um, but I don't see his career continuing on as long as he doesn't continue to remain injured over and over again. It's just not going to be feasible. It's not going to be good for him to have a healthy lifestyle if he continues to be in the ring. So that's just the way that's going to be. So yes, it is his time to hang it up. All right, this one's from Instagram. It comes from James the McMurray. I still don't understand the need for two mid-card titles. WWE saw the light and merged the world championships, but they're still clinging to two mid-card titles. Don't you think it just waters down each title and therefore each reign? Uh, I would love to see unification about somewhere in the future and for the winner to go on to be a dominant champion and to actually move up the card once their reign is over. Uh, yeah, James, I, I tend to agree with that. You know, they've had two mid-card championships for far too long. You know, what happened at SummerSlam was an interesting situation with the U.S. championship. But, you know, going forward, I think that they do need to merge the Intercontinental and U.S. championships. And I think there should be one Intercontinental champion. U.S. championship was a WCW title. And, yes, Cena elevated that championship like no one has before this last year. But... I think they need to keep the Intercontinental Championship lineage because it's it's more... It, they're both very prestigious in their own respective ways. we got to remember, the WWE U.S. Championship, if you really want to be nitpicky, only goes back to 2003. 
as far as lineage because they borrowed the NWA WWE lineage when they brought the belt back in 2003 as a SmackDown title. Whereas you know, Continental has gone uninterrupted except for a brief period between October of 2002 and May of 2003 since November 1979 when Pat Patterson won the tournament to become the first champion. Um, Intercontinental is going to be the World Prestigious title. Leave that one active and make the U.S. Championship go defunct again. Good question, James. Thank you. This is from at Cody Cobra 52. What is the most underrated tag team, past or present, in the history of wrestling? Whew, that's a good question. The most underrated tag team in the history, past or present, of wrestling. Um, my pick for that would probably be the tag team of the of British Bulldog and the Rocket, the King of Hearts, Owen Hart. That team was tag team champion, I believe, two times, if not once. Did, did definitely one, if not two. I'm saying that in proper language, obviously. Um, but they never really got a whole lot of credit because they both passed on so quickly after that. Owen in 99, Davey in 02. And neither one of them in the Hall of Fame yet. Uh, Owen should be. Davey should be. Um, but they were a great underutilized, under, well, not under U.S., because they were using them a lot in the Hard Foundation storyline later on in 1997. But um, I think they could have been a, a much more dominant championship team if they let them be, and they didn't. If, you know what? I think they're the only champions once. Fall 96 until they lost to Sean and Austin in 97. So, yeah, they could have been two-time champions, three-time champions. Who knows? They could have been great, and they didn't let them do it, and it sucks. All right, that's going to do it for this week's episode of Talk Wrestling. Thank you guys so much for watching. Continue watching next week. And don't forget to go to NoDQ.com for all the latest in news, wrestling, and more. Take it easy.